Good morning, church. Another blessed Sunday to each and every one of you. Indeed, God is so faithful and He's so good. God has given us another day full of His hope, full of His promises. Hallelujah. Kindly open your Bibles to Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. That is the goodness of our Lord. He will protect us. He will guide us. That even during these pandemic times, we know that God is with us. Hallelujah. We give you praise and we give you thanks, Lord Jesus.
Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of all majesty, risen King, Lamb of God, holy and righteous, blessed
Good morning, Church. Good morning, Word for the Word, families and friends. If you happen to be tuning in for the first time in this channel, we would like to welcome you in the 10 a.m. online worship service. It is good to worship the Lord in singing, and also we can worship our Lord our God in giving of our tithes and love offering. But before we pray, down below on your TV screen are information like bank details and other ways where you can send your tithes and love offering, mission pledges. If you still have questions, feel free to approach us, your pastor, and your leaders to assist you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness, your love, and mercy to us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we receive from you day after day, O oh God. For you are God who is faithful. For you are God who is sovereign and almighty. Father, we lift up to you the tithes, love, offering, and pledges, O oh God. Use this, O oh Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless our pastors, our elders, our leaders, O oh God in your special way bless each every brothers and sister who contributed and give lord god for the furtherance of your kingdom bless them O lord we lift up to you lord also our brother and sister who are affected with this current situation O god father i pray that you will hear their prayers and you will provide also for them O god father we thank you for your love your grace and their blessings oh god and lord we even lift up to you lord god our prayer requests and lord hear them oh god father we thank you and we bless you in jesus name we pray amen and amen god bless you all
church from how good it is to see you in worship on this a Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here in worship, but more important, our Lord is glad that you're here. You're here to honor Him, you're here to worship Him, and that's what you have been doing. Our praise and worship team, our, our choir singing for us, so we, we have been worshiping. But we come now to a very special time of the service. But let me just welcome all of you that have come, you that are the regular in our 10 o'clock worship service, the family. But I welcome you that are visiting with us. You, you've tuned in, you're here, and we welcome you to this worship. This is the Word for the World family. We meet every Sunday morning at this time, and it would be good to, to see you. So we welcome you for our worship. We, we're going to pray now. And I, you know, I, I won't, I always want to make sure that prayers never become ritualistic or just part of the program. Uh, you know, our Lord doesn't listen to that kind of prayer. He listens to prayers that are sincere, prayers that come from our heart. And, and we're, we're going to pray now. And we have, we have a long list of people who, who request prayer from us, from the church, from you. And, and I wouldn't even have time to go through the list. They, they come daily. And you, you hear about them. And we, we want to pray for them and pray for the Lord to be with us in these next few moments as we look at his word together. But can we be sincere in our prayer? Can we bow in the presence of our Lord knowing that he's here? And he will be listening. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the, this time that we can come together, we can sit together worshiping you and in the best way we can just bringing honor to you for who you are. And we just ask you in these next few moments as we turn to your word in this worship service, Lord, that you would be with us. This is your word that we are reading and we will be taking note of. So make it clear to us. Let, let the presence of your Holy Spirit be real to every one of us individually and personally and speak personally to, to us, Lord, from your word. And we'll thank you for all you accomplish in these next few moments in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Do you have your Bibles? Well, we're, we're going to a, a passage of Scripture. There'll be two that I'll be reading. And uh, if you happen to tune in to our our evening 9.30 p.m. devotional Bible study time. This passage, this first passage that I'll be reading is familiar to you. We've, we've been looking at it for several days, but I just felt like this morning that, that this passage had something to say to us as a, as a body, as a church. Now, the title I've given this sermon today is Christ's Return, Our Ultimate Hope. Christ's Return, Our Ultimate Hope. And if you remember last Sunday, we talked about hope. We, we looked at Hebrews 6, 19, where the writer talks about the hope and he says we have this hope as an anchor of our soul firm and secure that's what we talked about last week we talked about hope and it's interesting in two of our 
outreach churches who are celebrating. One has already celebrated in one in Cebu. They are celebrating their anniversaries. And they, these two churches took the theme of the one word, hope. And I thought as I was talking to them how appropriate that word is, especially today when we have so much coming at us so much uncertainties questions and hope is hope is it's what we need to anchor our soul and it has to be a real hope a living hope so we're going to talk about hope and i have called this hope that we're going to address our ultimate hope Christ's return, our ultimate hope. And you know, in, in calling it the ultimate hope, uh, there are hopes that we have, plural, I guess, but we can hope for tomorrow, we can hope for next week and on, because we are children of God. So we have these hopes that, that they anchor our soul, but there is an ultimate hope that all of us have. And it's Christ's return. And that can be an anchor. When we look at our world and the uncertainties and problems, that can be an anchor for our soul. Christ's return. Now let's read an Old Testament passage and then a New Testament passage. We're going to Zechariah, one of the minor prophets. I like Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14 and there are two verses that we're going to read, very interesting verses connected with the subject that we're talking about, our ultimate hope. But Zechariah, or Zechariah chapter 14 says this in verses 4 and 5, two verses. Verse 4 says, On that day his feet, Jesus' feet, his feet, very physical, this is a physical passage. Something physical happens. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And you, you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The last statement of verse 5. Then the Lord, the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, that is a day of our ultimate hope when Christ returns. Now there's one other passage in the New Testament connected with this, this passage that we're looking at, and this is Acts chapter 1. A very familiar passage, and it refers, it, it's a, an account, historical, biblical account of Jesus Return to the Father. He's completed his ministry. He died on the cross for us. He was resurrected. And it, in, in Acts chapter 1, there are three verses there connected with now what we have been reading from Zechariah. Acts chapter 1 and, and verses 9 through 11. Verse 9 says, After he said this, after Jesus had said this, he's talking to his followers. And his apostles, he's talking to them. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. Very physical. Before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently into the sky as he was going. When suddenly... Suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. We, we can only assume this is two angels who suddenly appears and stand, standing there with them. And they have a message for these 
followers of Christ. In verse 11, Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back. We'll come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, I've used the word physical and I use it again. This is an appearance. They've watched him. They physically, with their eyes, they watched him ascend back to the Father where he had come from. He, they watched him. And they were standing there looking into the, to the heavens. Not sure what they expected, but, but these two angels suddenly appear there and tell them, in the same way that you saw him go into the heavens, he's going to come again. Now let's look at these two passages that we've read. Zechariah tells us that when he comes on that day, there is a special day, when, when he comes back, to our earth, he will come back to the same spot in which he left. He left from the Mount of Olives near to Jerusalem. And Zechariah says, he's going to return to the Mount of Olives. He's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. He ascended from there. He's going to come back to there. His ascension was physical. They saw him. They saw it. And he's going to come back to that same spot. And he's going to plant his feet. And that says there's going to be a, a great earthquake that divides. And we, we that's somewhat mysterious. But, but he's coming back to the very same spot. I, I really think this is significant. And, I, you know, in the times that I've read this, and Zechariah talks about his coming back. And, you know, Zechariah, desc he describes it in a very dramatic way. But it's not just drama here we're talking about. But but he, he describes it as been a, a glorious return. In fact, in, in Titus, that little book of Titus, talks about that, about his glorious return to the earth. So he's going to return. And, and what I'm reminded of when I read these passages like this, I'm reminded of his first coming. You know, when he, when he first came, he, w he was born of the Virgin Mary. And uh, it was not a glorious coming the first time. And in fact, it, you know, he, he didn't have any place to be born. Uh, Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem because that's where they came from and there were no rooms and, and they just had to take a place to rest and sleep for the night where animals are kept and that's where Jesus was born and and there was no trumpets there there were no politicians and leaders and priests religious people no that they were not there there were angels who announced his coming to the shepherds. But, th but his first coming, we, we cannot describe it as a glorious coming. He came, but most of the world at that time, they didn't even know he had arrived. Some did. Some who, were, who knew the signs and were looking for him. But it was not a glorious man, but the, the next time that he comes, when he returns as Zechariah describes for us and as the angels promised us, this next time, <laughs> the world is going to know that he has arrived. He's come. And he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives and a, a huge earthquake takes place. And our world will know. Politicians, religious leaders, whoever they may be, you and I, every, everyone's going to know that, that he has come. And he's come back. He came the first time. And he's going to come again. And he, he himself promised he'd come again. But these two angels, 
Perhaps, you know, the apostles and the followers of Jesus forgot or didn't understand that he told them that he needed to leave. He needed to go back to the Father. You, you find that in John 14. And they were just standing, gazing into the heavens. And maybe in gazing, they expected him to maybe come back at, at that time. I, they just seem to be bewildered. That, that, that's the reason these angels come back and said, you know, here you're standing looking into heaven. You need to know something. He's going to come back just like you see him. You saw him go away. So, so he's coming back. Now, there, there are three questions that, that I have written down this week as I was studying this. And, and, and these questions are a little bit long. I hope that you'll be able to get them. Some of you take very good notes. Uh, some of you may be recording, and of course this message after the Sunday morning will be available on, on my Facebook, other uh, Word for the World Facebook, YouTube. It will be YouTube. But there's three questions. Let me let me pose these questions and an answer that I think will help us, but it's a little bit long. Let me give you number one, the first question. When will this return to the Mount of Olives take place? Okay. We know it's going to happen. The angel said he's going to come back. Zechariah says he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives and he's going to plant his feet there. So when is this going to take place? Get the, get the question now. When will this return to the Mount of Olives take place? When's it, when's it going to happen? Now, very quickly, let me make sure we understand as we pose this question. We're not talking about setting a date or a time, a year or whenever. That's not for us. In fact, Jesus said in that Acts chapter 1 to the apostles who asked that question, when are you going to set up your kingdom now? He said, it's not for you to know. And it's not for us to know. We don't know this. So when we, we, I'm posing this question, that doesn't mean we're going to look at some kind of date. We don't know that. But here's an, here's an answer that I'm proposing to my own question. When will this take place? Listen carefully. When will this take place? After all last day prophecies have been fulfilled. Now get that answer. When's it going to take place? When all last day prophecies have been fulfilled. Now let's talk about that a little bit. When Jesus was teaching uh, in, in Matthew 24 and 25, he talked about a lot of things that were, were going to happen. And, and Jesus was talking in the form of prophecies. And when you read chapter 24, you, you find all kinds of things that are going to happen. And you look at other Bible books and, and other writers and you, and you find various biblical prophecies which will be fulfilled. And there, there are a number of them, a lot of them. Each one, one by one, in its time, each prophecy will be fulfilled. It's not a chronological development, an unfolding, no. Each prophecy in its time will be fulfilled. And when they've all been fulfilled, there will be standing one prophecy, a prophecy that we have just read from Zechariah, the prophecy that the angels declared to the followers of Jesus. He'll come back and set his feet on the Mount of Olives. Now, a lot of things will happen. We'll look at some of that, but a lot of things will happen. But when he returns, all of the things that we talk about 
great tribulation, great distress, wars and rumors of wars, famines, all, all of these things. And, and it seems that some of these things are happening now. Now these are prophecies and they're going to be fulfilled. But after they've all been fulfilled, something dramatic can be expected. And it will happen. Jesus will return and all the prophecies building up to his return when he comes and sets his feet there. All these prophecies will have been fulfilled. Now, let's go to number two. The second question is, what will he do when he returns? Very simple question. He's coming. We know he's coming. Okay. What will he do when he returns? And, and you know, that, that is, that's a good question. It, it is a, a legitimate question. He's coming back. We know that. We have no doubt. That's our ultimate hope. So what's he going to do? When he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, what does he do? Well, let me give you my answer. Maybe it could be could come your answer, but you know that that is a big question, and I suppose there's a lot of answers. But what will he do when he returns? He will set up a permanent kingdom upon the new earth. Now, a lot is involved in that answer. But note carefully my answer to this question. He will set up a permanent kingdom upon the new earth. New earth. He returns, and the kingdoms of the world that may exist at that time that exists now, they come to an end. There will be one kingdom and one king, and it will be permanent. Now, I have mentioned the new earth. When he returns, he's going to set up an earthly permanent kingdom for you and I to dwell in, of course. But the permanent kingdom is going to be set up in a new earth. Now, there, there are two passages of Scripture, especially, maybe there's some others, but there's two passages of Scripture in reference to the new earth and, and why I have included a permanent kingdom. Well, what about this earth? And our earth is a mess. You know, we are destroying it. We're polluting everything that we're cutting down our trees and our forest and are polluting our waters and our air. And we need a new earth. Well, here's a couple of references, and I'll just give them to you and 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 refer to them. Second Peter. Number two, Second Peter, chapter three, and verse thirteen, one three. Second Peter, chapter three, and verse thirteen. And I'll, I'll leave you to read that. And I trust you. I think you'll read it. But here's what he says in that verse thirteen. Peter writing, he he says there, there will be when when all of this happens, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the new heaven is almost undescribable, so we'll leave, we'll leave it. But he says there will be a new earth. And as I've already mentioned, it stands to reason that this world, this earth has got to change because it is cursed by sin right now. So that curse will be lifted and we'll have a new earth. One other passage of scripture, and this one is in Revelation. In Revelation... 21, almost at the end of the Bible. 
Revelation 21 and verse 1. One verse of scripture. And, and the apostle John is the writer here. Revelation 21 and verse 1. And it refers to the same thing that Peter wrote about. And John, the, the apostle John, he declared that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So we have two writers of the New Testament, two books that declare to us that there's going to be a new earth. So that when Christ returns, plants his feet on the Mount of Olives, now maybe we can assume more than assumption, a couple of things here. We can assume that maybe the new earth has already been created, so the curse will have been lifted and, and he comes to a new earth. However, Zechariah says when he returns and he plants his feet, there will be an earthquake. So maybe the curse is still there until he comes and takes it away and creates a new world for us, a new earth. Now, I, you know, I, I'm quickly, I would quickly say, you know, there are, there are questions and questions, and my, I wish we had answers to all the questions concerning the Lord's return. But he's going to come back. He's going to. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives, and he's going to set up a permanent kingdom, and there will be a new earth. Now let's let's go to question number three. Question number three. What does that mean for us? He returns, he sets up a kingdom, a new earth. What does that mean for us? Now we're talking about this being our ultimate hope, and, and, and it is, it's our ultimate hope. So what can we expect in this ultimate hope when Christ returns, he sets up a permanent kingdom, no longer cursed because it's a new earth. So what... What does that mean for us? Now let me just give you one statement and then allow you in your own studies, prayer, you answer this question from scripture. But let me just give you this answer. What does it mean for us? We will enter into an eternal existence. Now get, get that answer. What does this mean for us? We will enter into an eternal existence. Now that statement means a lot. You see, you look at our world, you look at us, there's nothing permanent about, there's nothing permanent about us, there's nothing permanent about uh, the world we're living in, there's, there, there's nothing that you can see that is permanent. It's all temporary. And one day, the, even this earth as we know it, will give way to a new earth. So our, our surroundings are not permanent. We are not permanent. But here we have the ultimate hope of one day living in a kingdom, the kingdom of God, in permanent existence huh. what a hope now you, you look at our world today look at look at us now here, here we are we're, we're looking at a virus the COVID-19 that has bought, brought tremendous fear around the world it's fear of a disease, a virus that nobody seems to understand, that, that the medical world or whoever it may be, they cannot, they not, cannot answer the questions we have, that they can't stop it, they don't know what it is. So here we are, living in fear. 
and we mask ourselves, we put shields, we distance ourselves, we stay secluded because of a virus. Afraid that if we happen to contract the virus, we could die. That's a reality. Some do. So we live in a world that's, there's no permanence about it. And the, and, and the circumstances just, the circumstances remind us that we are not permanent. But we have hope. We have an ultimate hope in Christ. <laughs> okay, the world, politicians are doing what they can do. The, the medical world, hospitals are full, they're doing what they can. We cannot control it, we can't stop it. So we fear, we isolate, we hide. But one day, we're going to move into a permanent existence where fear will have gone, disappeared. Because we will have eternal life that is permanent while we live in the new kingdom with Christ being the king. So we have Christ's return, our ultimate hope. Do you have that hope? Just think of the word hope for a moment. Do you have real substantial hope for your life? Or do you live daily in fear? There's hope. There is a real hope that can be the anchor of your soul. And it's in Christ. It's in His return. It's in the day when He will set up His kingdom. And our world will be different. So as we close, uh, give thought to what, what hope that you really do have. Do you have a hope that will serve as the anchor? Do you have an ultimate hope? It's available. In Christ it's available. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Our Father, we thank you for the ultimate hope that you have given us in Christ your Son. And we do so look forward to the time that your Son will return to a world that rejected him when he first came. But we look forward to his return and we see that as our ultimate hope in you and his coming. I pray that this hope will become real and alive to every one of us who are listening today. In Jesus' name. Now you that are listening, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, the ultimate hope, if you've never accepted him as your personal savior, if you've never been born again, would you bow your heads and make a decision to accept him and let's pray. Just listen to the prayer. Repeat it. If you can out loud, repeat it in your mind. Repeat it. Let's pray this prayer. My Heavenly Father, you have spoken to my heart today. You've called me to come to you. I have come. I've come to, to accept your son Jesus into my life as my Savior, as my Lord, and I commit my life to Him. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, would you let us know? Word for the World Facebook, send us a note. Tell someone. Talk to someone about it. And God bless you as we close. Would you lift your hands for the benediction? And now may the love of God who is your Father and the grace and mercy of your Savior, Jesus Christ, the 
comforting, powerful presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now, as you may go, and forever. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you as you go. Hi, I want to invite you to our Zoom Life Groups. And this is something we really want to encourage you to be a part of. It's so important for us to have fellowship with the, with our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Especially times like this when we could have mutual encouragement in the faith, study God's word together, nourish our faith and our walk with the Lord and that we can be encouraged, we can encourage one another even in these difficult times to walk in the faith and to live for God and to have hope in the Lord in spite of all the problems we are facing. We can pray together, share our own testimonies to encourage one another, even share our problems that we can pray for each other together. So being a part of a small group is so important in nourishing our faith and our walk with the Lord. I want to encourage you to be a part of our Zoom life groups. Send us a message on our Word for the World Facebook page. Tell us uh, your interest in joining this small group. Give us your name and your address and uh, a little details about you and we would plug you into a small group. We have great leaders who are well trained to do this and they are very, very knowledgeable in the Word and they are so excited to bring you on board and make you a part of a small group then you can grow together in the Lord with your fellow brothers and sisters in the world. So, hope to hear from you and hope to see you in our small groups. God bless you.